Thank you very much. It's my greatest honor to receive this uh, prestigious award. My connections to DDL came back to 2009. So 10 years ago, as a PhD student, I gave my first oral presentations in the international conference in DDL. However, I have to apologize. In the past few years, I'm not able to attend a DDL. It's not because I don't want to come, just because the interesting US permanent resident application process prevented me going overseas. But luckily, I get this green card early of this year, so finally, I make it here, and the DDL, I'm back. OK, so before I talk about the, what I'm doing, I want to spend a little bit of time to uh, tell you what I am. So I'm original from China. And I studied the, the pharmaceutical science in the Shenyang Pharmaceutical University. So if you haven't heard that university, it has the, uh, China's uh, leading program in the pharmaceutical manufacturing and industrial pharmacy. It's quite a surprise to me when I get this degree. Can you tell what's wrong with that degree? It's a Bachelor of Engineering degree in pharmaceutical science. So it's an engineering degree in science. So that it really gave me a surprise when I get that. Because we not only studied physiology and the pharmacology, chemistry, we also have studied engineering pharmaceutical manufacturing equipment. So that really helped me a lot in my future career and collaborate with the engineers and also chemists. So after my college, I joined a pharmaceutical company. So that company has a relatively large R&D center and I'm, I'm working as a formulation scientist. So I worked there for two years. I would say it's quite a productive for two years. We developed the formulations for two new products and now all these products are available in the Chinese market. So after gaining this industrial experience, I moved to Singapore for my higher education, for my master's study. I'm very lucky to join this uh, lab uh, led by the professor Paul Han. So he's a pharmaceutical uh, scientist, uh, in, expert in the pharmaceutical technology. I would say it's lucky because this lab is actually a joint lab between the university and also this pharmaceutical equipment company, GEA. So we have access to all this new equipment, pilot scale equipment for our research. And after my master's study, I jumped again to Australia. And I studied at Monash University. So Monash has a world uh, top 10 leading program in pharmacy education and I worked with uh, Professor Peter Stood and uh, Professor David Morton. So we started working on this tri-powder coating and then characterization. And we have uh, quite the productive in publications, in industrial grounds, and uh, I enjoyed very much about the research. So this actually gave me the idea, why not pursue the career in the academic? So after I decided that, I moved to University of Sydney, working with Professor Hawking Chen and learned some new tricks. And we have been working on this uh, dry powder inhaler formulations for high dose antibiotics for almost uh, three years. I have learned a lot how to become an independent researcher. So what's the next step? It's very interesting because I find a job as a sitting professor at Purdue University. So where's the Purdue University? So you can see, it's actually a small college town in the Midwest of the United States. And uh, I would say it's very, very tough for me to move from, you know, like a Melbourne, Sydney, the most livable cities, move to the, <laughs> in the middle of the cornfields. And the very annoying snowing during the winter time. So you can imagine how difficult is that transition and how much my wife and my family sacrificed for my career. I really appreciate that. So this is uh, where I landed. Purdue University have the top 10 uh, pharmacy program in the United States and have the leading program in the industrial pharmacy. It has reputations in industrial pharmacy for many, many years, solid state chemistry, manufacturing, and uh, uh, coating technology. 
So you see like we are one of the few departments who has the industrial pharmacy in the department name. So we like to work with the industry scientists. I think that fit my background very well. And after four years, you see like uh, this is the, at the beginning of my job, just myself working in the lab. And after four years, we have about 12 to 13 people working in the lab. So group expanding quite well. We have uh, about 10 to 13 projects going on. So it's really amazing things to happen there. Okay, so I will talk about the, my research, but only concentrate on the part of dry powder inhalers because that is the mainstream of my research focus. So my personal preference is I like a dry powder inhaler formulations and the device a lot. This is because number one, we have a, a more, usually it's more chemical stable for the molecules to be in the solid state. And also we have the capabilities as a formula scientist, we have flexibility to work with these formulations, improve that. So all my research here I talk about is about dry powder inhaler formulations. So briefly talk about this, everybody knows this gold standard the one to five micron in aerodynamic dynamic diameter we need to go to the deep lungs or sometimes one to three uh, microns. Anyway, we talk about the particles in very, very small size. And usually these uh, small particles in the industry, they are produced by jet milling. The problem is if you break these coarse particles into very tiny, small uh, particles, you create this new surface with high surface energy, with high electric static charge, and a very low mass. So they are very problematic, every bit of those. They grow to form glomerates, lumpy powders. Very difficult to manufacture. Very difficult to put into capsules or blisters. And also very difficult to aerosolize, to be inhaled into the lungs. One of the strategy to deal with this for the low dose drug is you can blend that with cost carrier. Most of the cases, lactose. And form this kind of, we call all the, the mixtures. However, still some problem for this kind of formulation because number one, for the high dose drug like antibiotics, we don't want to use a lot of these excipients. Number two, if for some cases, the drug stick to the carrier too strong and they cannot separate during the inhalation. So costly low efficiency of your formulation device. So what we bring here is uh, one of the strategy to reduce this cohesion of the powders. So this strategy is dry, we call it dry coating. So if we have the problem with this sticky powders, particles, with this kind of a sticky surface, what we can do is how about the coat this sticky surface with some anti-sticky material, like magnesium stearate. And then we can form this kind of particles with much reduced thickness. However, if we want to achieve that, we do need some mechanical process. Because these uh, glomerates usually they have very strong. They can stick to each other. You have to break them and expose individual particles, code individual particles. Otherwise, you just code these lumps. So my PhD supervisor, David Morton, he, in 2007, he came back from the industry to the academic. And I'm literally the first, uh, uh, he's the first PhD student. And he bring this idea of dry coating approach because we believe the dry coating compared to the wet coating, like a fluid, fluid bed coating, dry coating is simpler, safer, greener, and cheaper because we don't use, use any solvents. We don't have any drying step. So this is the first technology uh, we have uh, applied, called mechanical fusion. So it's uh, derived from the high shear mixing, so it's a technology developed by Hustle Cover. And the operation is very simple. So you can look at it here, what do we do? We put our coating materials and also our powders into this processing chamber. And this process had rotated at very high speed and push the powder mixtures through a very small gap 
one to three millimeter. And then that will generate the shear force and the press force applied to this coating material, make the coating material, which is usually either soft or small, onto the host particle surf surface. So the process is very simple. They don't need a skilled person to operate that, but interactions inside this chamber are very complex. Actually, this uh, technology has been used in other, uh, in other kind of industry. They have this uh, scale up capabilities to produce this, uh, for example, toners for the printers, but it has not been used for pharmaceutical. So this is an old story. I presented uh, in the, about two years ago in DDL. So you see like uh, we actually we code the different type of uh, drugs with 5% magnesium stearate. And we found that they all have a significant increase in the, regarding the fine particle fraction. And even more exciting is, we found we can actually make the final fine particle fraction into a very small window. So that is very exciting, why? Because I was a PhD student at that time. I'm still naive and uh, ambitious. So I told my PhD supervisor, can we think about the more ambitious? Can we actually normalize the particle surface by coating them with a coating, same coating material? And make the also performance similar for all the different drugs, which has the similar particle size. What does it mean? So I'll give you an example. It doesn't matter what the particles are coming with what kind of a surface. It's amorphous, crystalline, hygroscopic, it doesn't matter because we coat them with a very powerful coating and make them not only look the same, but also need to perform the same, okay? So this is my ambitious hypothesis. But we need to test that very carefully. Unfortunately, we found that this drug, triancelolone, is very cohesive. Before the coating, a very low performance. Even if we increase the fine particle fraction to almost double, it still cannot make that windows. So which means like we do need to carefully test our hypothesis, because just in case some particles, they look maybe similar, but they don't perform the same. <laughs> so this is an old joke I presented 10 years ago. However, after that, I, after I joined Purdue, I found that indeed there are some commercial products approved or still in the market or not in the market. There are few products they use magnesium stearate in their products. But I found that there's a knowledge gap here, their lack of fundamental understanding, how this kind of a coating can affect the aerosol performance. How good is the coating is enough? So after I joined Purdue University, we collaborated with the uh, industrial scientists in AstraZeneca and the Genentech. So we have this project to try to coat the drug particles with different kind of uh, coverage of the excipients. And see can we, when we find the correlations between the coating quality and aerosol performance. So what we do is like we use dry coating, we use a different approach called the core jet milling with the different excipient. We choose ciprofloxacine hydrochloride as a model compound because it's high dose and is being developed for dry powder inhaler. inhaler. We coat with different material, I mean, indian steroid and leucine. Both have been used a lot for the dry powder inhaler research. We manually blend in them and then put into jet milling and then just pass them 10 times and then try to coat them. So we can achieve both the size reduction and also the coating. So we use jet milling because number one, I don't have magnetic fusion in my lab in at Purdue. Number two, the literature published by Professor Hartwig Stackel and also uh, Professor Poyan and Danny shows uh, cold jet milling can give you this kind of a coating. So number one, we measure the physical particle size by laser diffraction. So you can see here the physical size, there's not much difference. So if any changes in aerosol performance, it's not coming from the size. 
So we measure the ELSO dispersion, use the next generation impactor, and use a very uh, common device, RS01 low resistant uh, inhaler from uh, Plus DRP. It's uh, very similar to the Osmo inhaler. So this is the data. On the left side is the magnetosteroid coating. So we increase the coating concentration from 0.5% to 10%. And uh, it's very interesting until we put 5% magnetosteroid, and then we found the significant increase in the fine particle fraction. However, a different behavior has been found for the losing coating. So you see on the right side, only 0.5% losing give you a very significant increase. But for both, after 5%, there's no further increase. Probably 5% is enough. So let's try to find out why there are different behavior and why 5% are enough. So we try to understand what's going on there, what happens on the surface. We believe we modify the surface. And this is the uh, surface energy distribution data we measured to use IGC, inverse gas chromatography. And it's not a surprise, so this is the uh, magnetosteroid coating data. So this is the dispersive surface energy. So this blue line are the drug Cipro jet milled without any excipients. So just the, jet, just the Cipro jet milled. Of course, we expect it has a higher surface energy and then the coated one, the cultured milled one, has lower surface energy. And uh, when we have a more maintenance steel rate, the lower of the surface energy. So that is expected for both dispersive and uh, specific, which is polar, and also the total surface energy. So that is expected. However, losing coating gives us some surprise. The difference are not as big as the maintenance steel rate. And also you see like all this losing coating has uh, the same surface energy. So that's interesting. They have a higher surface energy than the magnetosteroid coating, but they have a better uh, aerosol performance. So that's a contradictory to what we expected. So we try to find out what's going on there. So we look at the SEM images, you can see for the magnetosteroid coating, the surface are relatively smooth. And for the losing coating, you see these tiny dots on the particle, major particle surface. So what we proposed here is the two different materials give you the two different mechanisms to improve the aerosolization. Magnetosteroid is a very famous lubricant. They actually have this kind of multi-laminar structure. They are very easy to delaminate upon the shear stress. So they can form a type of a film. However, for the loosing, it's very difficult to delaminate. It's not going to form a film. It's actually form this kind of a spiky little dots on the particle surface. So we don't need a very good coverage for loosing because the purpose is try to separate the two particles. And this a little bit of separation will reduce the Van der force significantly. So we try to prove that. We actually use this uh, FD4 rheometer in the shear cell mode, try to understand what's going on here. And the shear cell, you see, like they put the blade in half of the powder, and then they give some pressures, like they ro rotate. So they actually majorly measure the friction between the powder beds. You see here, we have a significant reduction in this shear cell cohesion because we believe magnetosteroid form a kind of a film, lubrication film, which can reduce the friction a lot, but not for the losing, because these dots will not actually reduce this kind of shear cell cohesion, friction. And also we try to understand more regarding the coverage quality. We try to create that, can we have this correlation? However, that's very, very difficult. Because we talk about the very small particles, one to two micron, three micron. So if you use like a traditional imaging system like FDIR or Raman, you cannot imagine the surface because the probe depth is one, at least one to two micron. You actually measure the whole particle. 
So what we need is a kind of surface sensitive measurement with both the quantification and also qualitative measurement capability. And also we need a high spatial resolution. So that's extremely difficult. So here we actually develop a platform it consists in two different technologies. Both are surface sensitive. And here the first one I want to introduce is X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy, XPS. So XPS is a surface measurement. They can measure up to 10 nanometer on the top of surface. And what they do is like they use X-rays to irritate the particles of solid surface. And then the surface will receive this energy. They will actually send off the electrons. So the different uh, element, even the same element, but different uh, chemical states, they will send the electrons with the different kinetic energy. So you see here, when we receive that kinetic energy and also number of the electrons, we get the profiles like this. So what we do is that we, even with the materials with the same component, like uh, both the carbons, they can have the different diagram or spectrum here. So what we do, we take the reference, pure compound reference spectrums, and we actually try to integrate user software to best fit our measured spectrum. So we can estimate how much is from the component A how much is coming from the component B. So give you some quantitative ideas. And uh, coupled with the second technique, TOPSIMS, time of flight, secondary eye mass spectroscopy. So that one can give you qualitative distribution of the different materials in a scanned area with very high spatial resolution and high surface sensitivity. So you see here, they can measure up to one to two nanometer on the top of the surface, and also give you a relatively high spatial resolution up to 200 nanometers. So we use that in this study. And the look at the SPS data. You can see here, we do have the increase of the surface coverage by lubricant when we increase the concentration of magnesium stearate. However, compared to the uh, magnesium stearate, the leucine has much lower number of the coverage on the particle surface. So which means like the, the, the improvement of the aerosols for the leucine coatings, we don't need a, too much coating on that. So this is the top scene images. So you can see when we increase the magnesium stearate, so these uh, green dots are the drug, and the red signals are the coating material. So you can see here we have these more and more coating materials on the particle surface. And based on the XPS data, we try to do some correlation. And uh, even we do very straightforward, a simple linear regression, we found some correlations here, both for the leucine coating and also magnesium stearate coating. However, I want to note, we believe this kind of correlation are material dependent. For example, for losing coating, the slope is much higher. We don't need a lot of coating coverage to be effective because they don't need to form these uh, films. Only maybe very low percent of the particles can separate the major particles. Okay, so the second part, I will talk about the spray drying. So spray drying is also uh, one of my favorite uh, formulation techniques. It's been used in the uh, dry powder inhaler formulations. Uh, for example, Toppy Pot Haler, and also this is uh, spray dry the manitol for inhalation. And even not to mention about the inhaled uh, insulin, they also produced by spray drying. Why I like it, because uh, for spray drying, I have a freedom to manipulate the particle properties by change the formulation, by change the operating parameter. However, spray drying, I would say, is not a universal. It still has some challenges. So here, because I worked at Purdue, which is a very famous in solid state chemistry, so everybody care about the stability. I think the industry also care about the stability as well. So this is an interesting project. We spray dry ciproprocessing hydrochloride hydrate. 
and up, right after spray drying, they are morphous. However, because usually the morphous is not stable, the problem is for these small molecules, over the time, if you over the time are exposed, exposed to the humidity or exposed to the heat, they are going to crystallize, transfer to the more stable crystal form. So you see like, a, so how, how's that affected the aerosol performance? You see, even we put that into a mild RH, relative humidity 55%, over a few days, the particles start crystallization and the fine particle fracture is going up. Why is that? We measure the surface roughness. We believe the surface roughness have some kind of effects there because you have a rougher surface, you have a less uh, contact area between the particles. Because we measure the density, actually density didn't change very significantly or a little bit increased actually because they crystallized. So that's a stability problem. If we just spray dry it and then store for some time and then the also performance uh, almost doubled, that can cause the overdose of the patient. So we try to figure out how we can solve that problem. So here strategy is still protective coating, but we do it through the spray drying. So we try to make these coating materials more on the surface, and then we get uh, our molecules more in inside. So we protect the surface. So we try the different kind of excipients. We found the loosing is a very interesting excipient. It's actually on, more on the surface. They precipitate earlier on the surface because they have a lower solubility in the solvents, in the water. And they not only increase the aerosol performance, but also they actually stabilize the particles regarding the aerosol performance, even exposed to the humidity. What we believe is because we measure the surface composition, we found the loosing is more on the surface. And we believe it's actually loosing control the surface morphology. Even Cipro still crystallize. They crystallize inside. They didn't change the morphology. So you still can have this kind of stability. So that's a very interesting strategy for us. And we learned from that, we further do another study because we want to minimize the use of the excipients in these high dose dry powder inhaler formulations. So we found a, another interesting molecule, cholestine, another antibiotic. It has a synergistic antimicrobial activity with Cipro. And it's a polypeptide. It's, we found it's very stable, even exposed to the humidity, they won't crystallize because the size of the molecule. And uh, here we use that as a kind of a polymer. So you see like uh, when we call spray dry them, number one, they control the surface because this molecule has both the hydrophobic group and hydrophilic group. So they would like to like a surfactant, they stick into the air liquid interface. And also they stabilize the Cipro from crystallization, just like a polymer matrix. And we try to understand the molecular interactions use FDIR. We do find some kind of molecular interactions there. So let's go back to the clistin, very interesting molecule. It's a polypeptide antibiotic. We call it last resort against the multi-drug resistant uh, grand negative infections. There's a commercial product of clistin DPIs in Europe. And uh, why it's interesting because you see the structures, it's going to stick to the surface as surfactant, and they have a relatively very good aerosol performance, and it's never crystallized, which means like physically stable. But still, it has its own problem is, you see this is a dynamic web absorption data. When we put it into the humidity, this amorphous cholestine re re absorbed a lot of water, up to 30%. So what's the problem for that? If you're exposed to the high humidity, for example, RH 75%, they will form this kind of absorb a lot of moisture on the surface. 
And then this will increase the capillary force between the particles. That will decrease the aerosol performance a lot. If we expose to the 80%, it will just melt. You cannot inhale at all. So regarding the quality, how we can improve that, but of course you can put it into a kind of a package. But we formulation scientists think we can solve the problem from the beginning. We don't need to worry about the leaking, the package, or anything like that. So what we do is we actually use the same strategy to move the hydrophobic molecules, reduce the solubility in this core solvents. And then we can move the hydrophobic molecules on the surface and get this kind of a protective coating. We try the loosening is working. And we try another hydrophobic uh, antibiotic, azithromycin. Very interesting, azithromycin also have the synergistic antimicrobial activity with calistin. So, yes, we did achieve to get azithromycin on the surface. And then we provide this kind of stability. So that is interesting thing, like one stone kill two birds. We have enhanced the antimicrobial activity. We have this kind of stability. So after we get all these uh, very nice, uh, interesting formulations, we try to evaluate that in both in vitro and in vivo models. So here we actually uh, develop a list of in vivo animal models for the inhaled uh, uh, antibiotics. So this is a uh, uh, pan-sensory device and uh, do this intratracheal delivery. And we collaborate with some pharmacometricians and uh, do the population PK model for inhaled cholestine powder formulation in rats. And uh, this model seems like the experiment data fit very well to the model we developed. We also have this uh, mouse lung infection model to evaluate PKPD. And we found that for, at least for this pseudomonas aeruginosa, this is a medical strain from the CF patients. And we found that this AUC in the epithelial lung fluid over MIC are the most predictive PKPD index for pulmonary delivery of a cholestine. And also we try to understand more about the drug delivery, drug disposition. What's going on after we put that uh, uh, drugs onto the lung epithelial cells? So we use this uh, in vitro human lung epithelial cell model, CALU3, has been used a lot in the past. We evaluate the drug delivery performance in this air interface, the culture, and we can do this kind of 3D imaging how much and how quick they can be absorbed and be transported from this side to the other side. We also have a lot of work in the, uh, this entailed biologics, because nowadays uh, biologics attract increasing interests from the pharmaceutical industry. So this is collaboration. We work with uh, Professor Jenny Liang at uh, Hong Kong University, uh, develop this SIRNA, inhaled uh, formulations. And this is collaboration with Monash University about the polypeptide. And this is even the nano particles. We try to form a matrix microparticles to get a better aerosol inhalation performance. So this is uh, one last uh, type of study I want to talk about is uh, when I joined the Purdue University, we collaborated with a protein solid state chem uh, chemist Professor Liz Top. So she actually have developed a new method to in understanding the hydrogen bondings within the proteins or between the proteins regarding the aggregation. I try to convince uh, this uh, kind of a traditional parenteral protein formulation scientist. Can we use a better method to produce these solids than lyophilization? Because everybody knows lyophilization is a time consuming process. It's batch process with very, very low energy usage efficiency. I have seen like a number only 2%, 3% in some literatures. And also talk about my own experience. Why I work in the company, we do this technology transfer for the lyophilized interferon products. And one day when we do that in the middle of the process, the power fails. Unfortunately, because it's not a common in that area, 
So the backup generator, electricity generator is not working. So the whole batch was about at least $10 million go to the landfill. And a few guys get fired, not me. But still, that actually pushed me to think about is any other better way to produce this. I would say uh, our formulation scientists in the inhalation products actually quite a pioneering because back to 90s, inhalation scientists are exploring this spray-dried protein like Genentech, they do this spray-dried permazine, not never go to the market anyway, and also spray, like spray-dried inhaled insulin, right? And this is another interesting product First, FDA pro approved the sterile spray-dried protein products, approved in 2015. So they spray-dried two different protein products, mixed, put into a well. So this is a topical product. So I convinced a few of the pharmaceutical companies, so we have a collaborations. So this is a collaboration with Pfizer. And they donated these monoclonal antibodies. We try to compare spray drying and also the lyophilization, which one is better. But we do see some like uh, instability regarding the physical aggregation for the spray dried particles. Why is that? We believe this is because of the nature of the spray drying. As I mentioned, proteins are actually very surface active. They are going to stick to the air liquid interface. And uh, the problem is they will hide the excipients in the corn. For example, protecting excipients, sugars. So the surface proteins get less protected, exposed to the humidity, exposed to the heat. And that could cause the stability problems. So what, this is a recent study we just get accepted. We actually use the different excipients to cover the surface of the protein particles. And then we try to see if we get more coverage of the proteins on the surface, will that induce the less interaction between the excipients and the proteins and cause instability. So this is a, a, a interesting result. I don't want to talk too much about the, what is this peak area, but that's an indication of the interactions between the excipients and also the protein. You see these correlations. So that's the uh, major focus of our research, but also a lot of interesting research going on in my lab. So this is a recently published paper. We use a spray freeze drying to produce this, uh, uh, we call the liposomal powders. And also we try to understand the stability of the different type of uh, nodules. Are they going to affect this surface property and uh, stability? So the last but not least, I would acknowledge and thank you very much to the collaborators, both in industry and also academic. Honestly, I personally, I love to collaborate with industry scientists because that is the way you know what's the real problem in the products. And I hope to work together to solve the problem. And uh, I also appreciate the funding support from the both governments and also the organizations and also the company. I think that one of the advantage when I moved to United States is the exposures to this kind of collaborations with the industry. The last I would welcome you guys to visit Purdue. It's not just the cornfields. It still has some like legacies there, not only in the pharmacy, but also in the aerospace. If you don't know, actually, they call Purdue the cradle of the US astronauts. One third of US astronauts, totally 24 astronauts, are graduated from Purdue, including the first man and the last man who landed on the moon. So this year is the 150 years anniversary of our university. So the slogan is the giant lips. So that's coming from the Neil Armstrong who landed on the moon first. A word saying like, that's one small step for a man, one giant leap for mankind. So I always encourage my student, think big and go bold. Think something bold, right? But don't go bold like this. <laughs> and uh, thank you very much for your attention. 
and uh, appreciate any questions.